Okay. Well, hello. I am Nomad. I discharged from the South Korean military two years ago as a sergeant, and I was in the Republic of Korea Army. As many people might as well know, South Korea is one of the few countries that still does mandatory military services. However, there are some exceptions where if you're a foreign residing Korean citizen or if you've lived in foreign countries or studying there, you have a higher chance or other ways that you could get exempt or delay your military services. For me, however, I ended up volunteering my service in early, meaning that I just ended up calling the National Defense and I told them I want to enlist and so just give me a date whenever. And they said, yeah, sure. And they actually <laughs> didn't take too long to process the documents. And I ended up enlisting on 2018. Most people would say, why did you join? Or you could have delayed it or not even gone at all. But why did you? I guess when I first got in, half of myself was saying, well, I'm still a Korean citizen. You know, I, I have the Korean passport and that's something that everybody goes through. So might as well join and to see how things go. The other half of me, I was going through kind of rough times and I needed a space and time to kind of think over my life. And I thought that maybe in the military, I'll find something that I've kind of lost. So yeah, I joined and it was actually kind of exciting to put it in a way where it felt like I was waiting in the line for a roller coaster. Like, ah, what's it going to be? Um, how's the life going to be there? Is it going to be as bad as people say? Or is it going to be okay? Well, when I first got there, one of the hardest struggles I had was communications. I am fluent in Korean as well as in English. However, I can't say that I understand it perfectly as in I understand the cultures. So once it came to the way we talk or how we treat the superiors or everything like that, it was kind of intense. It was kind of difficult because there were many incidents that I just couldn't understand. For example, you need to get permission to do something and there were different ways of talking uh, depending on the ranks, not just as ranks, but to your comrades as well. But yeah, everything went smoothly, I guess. And then after a month, um, we ended up getting all being sent to where our units will be. So after getting the private, I've been told and I actually searched online before enlisting saying that for those who are foreign residing citizens that volunteer for their service, you could end up being stationed near where your home address is at. I didn't have a home in Korea, but I did have a relative who lived there, my grandmother. And I was thinking, well, my grandmother's living south of Seoul, so I should be stationed pretty somewhere far in the rear. And this is what I've been hearing. Everybody's been saying, oh yeah, you gotta, you gotta get sent to the rear, you know? Frontline is the worst. Like there's nothing there but potatoes or there's nothing there but mountains and everything. And I was like, oh yes, hopefully I'll get a free pass on this. And later they said, Nomad. And I said, yes, sir. You're being sent to this, this division. And I'm like, okay, I mean, that should be good. And they gave us a brief time to kind of meet our families before, right before being sent to our units and everything. I luckily got my phone and I searched up what division that was. The moment I clicked, all the related searches were the toughest unit in Korea, toughest place on the earth. And it's like, what should I do? I got this division. And they're like, oh, go cure yourself. I'm like, what, what is this? And I searched it up. It was the name that I even knew because it was on television, like as one of the fiercest units. And it was on the front line too. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, I'm being sent to the front line? This wasn't in my plan at all. But oh well. After we met our families, we came back to our um, boot camp. And <laughs> that was even a ceremony where they said something something division, something something division. For those who are designated in these divisions, please stand up. And they were like, 10 or 20 of us like standing up and <laughs> and the drill instructor just went these guys are the guys who are being sent to the front lines so let's give them a random applause and all these like recruits all these privates are like Ooh! and i'm like wow oh yeah like you know if you if you, if you can't fight it just gotta enjoy it you know so we got on our train and like the train was supposed to move all the way down from the south up to the front and it was kind of funny when i was looking out at the window of the train <laughs> the more and more we see like cities like because we're nearing 
Seoul. And I was like, wow, like, and I could see like soldiers dropping off because they're stationed there. And I'm like, wow, what would it be to actually serve inside the city? They can go out every day. Like they could see the city views and everything. But then our train went through a tunnel. <laughs> and when it came out, there was nothing but mountains and like hills everywhere. And I'm like, oh, this is it, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And once I arrived, there were two um, buffed up looking soldiers who I thought they were my seniors and I just saluted at them like, <laughs> and they said, oh, no, no, you don't do that yet. <laughs> yeah, we're not even your seniors. We're probably going to dispatch you within the division to a smaller unit inside that. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. But yeah, when I got sent there, a bunch of officers came in to kind of like pick us up. We're basically like products in a mall. They're like, hmm, this guy looks pretty pretty buffed up all right you're recon and like hmm do you look like you can lift some heavy stuff you're artillery but what happened to me was <laughs> oh um what did you say you could do and i said i could speak four languages sir and i went to this school like i went to that and i lived in the states for a while and they're like hmm infantry i'm like really <laughs> like okay where does that lead me and they're like well, you're infantry. So I was dispatched into this infantry division. Infantry is basically another word for minions. So basically, you got to do everything. When I was there, I thought I was like, okay, well, I'm infantry. I'm riflemen. They should just teach me basic stuff, like how to shoot a gun, I guess. When I got there, they said, we actually lack a space for CBRN units. I'm like, what is CBRN? And they said, yeah, are you interested? It gives you more vacations. I'm like, vacations? Hell yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. And there I was not knowing what CBRN was. So CBRN is short for chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiation. So basically I became a reconnaissance unit where when the shit hits the fan, the North Koreans are going to be shooting like chemical weapons, biological weapons, everything at us. And I was supposed to be taking the role of wearing all that like we call it a hazmat suit or MOPP suits. We had to wear that, get our gun, and we had to reconnaissance. We had to search that area where the chemical weapons are at. I thought it was cool because I played some video games. I was like, wow, like I could be like those cool guys from Rainbow Six. But the reality was just me sweating my balls off in this airtight suit, climbing a mountain with 10 kilograms of like chemical detection unit on one hand and like a rifle on the other climbing a mountain and <laughs> the seniors going get the fuck up here and I'm like with my gas mask like full of fogs and all and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> basically it was like that for the good half of the year and then well some unexpected events were happening such as I had a new guy who came in by the time I was private first class, where I got promoted once. And when the new guys came in, the officer had to call me and tell me, Hey, Nomad, like, could you come here for a second? And I said, what's, what's wrong, sir? And he said, this guy can't speak Korean. And I said, what? <laughs> You mean, he's not from the U.S. forces, right? Like, this is an actual recruit that we got, right? And he said, yeah, this guy can't speak Korean at all. And I'm like, how did he even get past the boot camp in that case? And he's like, I don't know. Well, he's in your hands now. And I said, well, shit, okay. Apparently, I'm one of the only English-speaking person in the whole barracks. So, yeah, at first, I was really excited because I haven't got to talk in English for a while. And, you know, it was really nice and it was really welcoming to have someone who have the similar background. Apparently he also joined voluntarily thinking, well, all the Korean male does it. I also have a Korean heritage. Why not? So that happened for the first couple of months. Well, for the whole rest of the military life, we got along well. Well, we did have some bumpy roads, which I'll talk about it later. As time goes past, things were fun many of the times because people just being stupid because, you know, there's nothing much to do even if there are some things to do. Like, you gotta make fun out of it. Otherwise, it gets really unbearably um, depressing sometimes. For instance, one of the th hardest moments I had when I was a private was memorizing names. Like, I had to memorize the names of an entire company, which is approximately 40 people or so. I had to remember their names, not just their names, but the 
year and the month when they enlisted. And I got scolded if I didn't remember it properly because you had to address each of them accordingly by their ranks and everything. And for me, it was even a struggle for those who are like born and raised in Korea. But for me, it was just something that, yeah, sure, I can remember the names, but just because I say something wrong, like, and I get scolded by that, I don't know, that took a bit for me to get used to. During the whole time, there were cases where I just couldn't understand why the seniors would go so cruel or harsh on us. And like, for example, they would just stash like bunch of shit that we have to carry for the entire platoon or like for entire squads when in fact those are squad supplies so like if we distribute it evenly we could all like carry without much struggle but what they do is like they'll just there you go privates you know i thought they were psychopath or i thought they were really mean like for no reason and that perception slowly changed as i spent more time in the military where whenever i would go on outpost duty with them which we would have to stand guard in like a pillbox for like two hours um, from for instance 12 o'clock to 2 a.m or something like that and since we gotta do nothing um we don't have anything to do we end up talking and each story that i hear makes me realize oh like wow these guys are really young like some of them like just came in right after high school some of them are even younger than me some of them were the same age as me each of them had their own stories going on like i had a person who had like a youngest brother who's like two years old or five years old and i had a guy who had to drop out of his high school just to feed his family someone who has a driver's license for a forklift <laughs> and like <sighs> I don't know, like, it, it made me realize that all these young guys or all these kids, I was a kid too, but all these kids are here to protect our country, right? And I don't know, it, it, it got me thinking, what is it that we're here for, you know? Like, for instance, yeah, we're here to protect our country. We were here to protect our family and everything. But then that difference in reality between the military base and when i'm out during the vacations or holiday passes are so different when i go out it feels like i'm either invisible or like nobody recognizes so when i was in the states i saw a lot of american forces like people appreciating their service and everything like that and compared to that with what we get in korea was so different where one of the times when i was out during vacation i was in a subway and this old man was trying to get out but he couldn't leave in time as the doors were shutting down what i did was i grabbed the doors and i tried to like hold it open so that he could go by but then i realized the moment i grabbed it and <laughs> held it like oh if i break this <laughs> then they're gonna file something at me you know like a soldier cannot damage government property. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I can't. And I just let go. And this guy, uh, this old gentleman just said, I missed the, I missed the station because of you, you stupid idiot, like, or something like that. And I was like, I'm sorry, sir. Like, I'm really sorry. And he just went on and said, like, you know, back in my time when I was serving, like, we would have actually busted that door open. Like, soldiers these days are all a bunch of, like, cowards or, like, are all a bunch of kids. And I, I couldn't say anything. I just said, well, I, I apologize for the whole thing. But anyways, there was this strong, felt like a huge wall between the military and what's happening in real life. There were a lot of suicides in Korean military. This doesn't exclude officers as well. We actually had one officer who jumped out of the building and killed himself. Um, and I was like, wow, that's, that's something. I thought it was going to be at least on newspaper or something, but this happens every day. Like, soldier kills themselves every day. So, never made it through the news. The only th way we knew is during the morning briefing, an officer will come, tell us about what happened in the day or something like that. And he said, well, the officer on our next battalion, neighboring battalion, killed himself. He jumped. And we were all just like, ah, shit. But, but what can we do? Another way I knew that people in the outside world doesn't actually care about us or doesn't actually know what's happening in the military is when I first got in, people were talking about this one soldier that ended up cutting his own leg with a saw, like cut his own leg off, grabbed his leg that was server, dragged it all the way to battalion headquarters, placed it on top of the officer's desk and said, 
can I go home now? That's just insane. But that's just something that, you know, you would hear within the military. You won't hear it anywhere else. I think there's a strong disconnection between us and outside world. Sometimes I even heard that Koreans military these days are just like picnic. <laughs> We're like Boy Scouts. That's what they say. Oh, don't you guys like it when you guys get free food? You get like a place to stay, like shelter, and they even pay you, don't they? Whenever they say that, I always say, well, then good luck fucking working your ass off 24-7, receiving $300 a month. You like that? You want to work $300 a month and risk your life knowing that there are potential enemies that we are fighting? Unlike any other country, we have an enemy right up north and people don't realize that sometimes. So times passed um, and I was promoted to a corporal. During my corporal time, our whole base was stationed to this ammunition depot. Ammunition depot meeting is the whole military base that supplies ammunition to other divisions and all. And ours was extremely huge, as in they were big enough to supply the entire core. We were sent there, and you know how I mentioned previously about the guy who couldn't talk in Korean at all? Well, that guy and I were kind of on a fixed duty, meaning that each time when you're guarding, you have to be two man, one group kind of duty cycle, where we were sent to the pillbox, guard there for two hours, and and two people have to be in there all the time. Because nobody would be willing to go on to duty use with him, I ended up going with him, which I liked, you know? But then if you end up talking to the same person for four months, <laughs> then you and the partner will eventually get tired of each other. At one point, I even heard them say, sometimes I want to fucking kill you. Like, could you just shut the fuck up like once in a while? And I said, oh, well, like, I'm your superior, you know, fuck you and things like that, you know, small chatters. There's one point where for both me and him, we had a rough time both inside the barracks and outside. I had a lot of family issues going on where um, my father is not in perfect health condition and our family's all living spread apart and for me hearing littlest things like oh your father was actually in a hospital or like oh like kind of economical issues you know whenever i hear that i never felt so trapped i was in this military base i had to do something i really wanted to at least be there for someone but i couldn't i was just trapped here and that slowly ate inside me that slowly made me have nightmares and have myself struggle all the time that was the same case for my buddy, where inside the base, no one would try to talk to him. Even if they do, they do it out of kind of entertainment, you know? They're just curious. And because they're so different culturally, there's always this tension between him and the superiors and everything like that. So inside the barracks, he's already like that. And adding on to that, he can't leave. He can't go on vacations that often. At one point during one of our outpost duties, he just told me, dude, I'm getting this dream where I'm killing everybody. I'm shooting everybody with a 5.56, every single one of you. And, and I said, how long has that been? And he said, it's been two weeks and it's going. And I said, you know, uh, like I feel for him. At the same time, I got scared because I know how much isolation or how much stress a person is put under could do. Like the only way I could help him was to just listen to him and talk to him and tell him about what's going through me as well. And that's how we kind of held on to each other. I guess. And at one point, so many things happened for me outside of the military and just myself personally that I just, I couldn't function at all. When I'm sleeping, I sleep talk and I yell sometimes and I'll just like can't go to sleep. And when I wake up, I don't feel like I'm woken up. So at one point, I just called my platoon officer and said, can I talk to you privately? So yeah, sure. I go up to the roof of the barracks. I just said, I don't know. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. I need help. And he said, well, I promise you I will keep this confidential and I'll see if I could dispatch you a, a consultant. You know, every army has one. So we'll, we'll see if you could recover from that. <laughs> I said, I really don't wish I could have this conversation shared with other people. In the military, um, Korean military, there's something called being flagged where if you have the background of whether your parents got divorced or if you have any mental disorders, psychological shock or anything like that, they flag you secretly in your documentation. So there will be a flag in there. So I already have a flag because my parents divorced. So I said, I don't want any of that. Uh, I just want consultant would be nice. I just want someone to talk to, vent off, you know. The next day, <laughs> I hear from the officer's speaker saying, Corporal Nomad, get to the HQ immediately. And I go there. <laughs> 
All the officers are there. They said, we heard what's going on with you. He told everybody, all the officers there, that something is up to with me and they said we'll dispatch you a psychiatrist or something like that and i said oh well at least i'm getting help so the next day or within the week the consultant came in but there's one thing that you should know is that the consultants or psychiatrists in the military base they're very limited it's like one person is handling probably hundreds of soldiers so they couldn't keep up they can't cure all of them you know get them all back to perfect condition so they changed the directions i think from recovering someone to preventing them from making rational or like extreme decisions so to prevent them from harming themselves or others became their main goal of course i have no tendency to harm myself or others he just listened to my stories and honestly that got better like that made me feel better he just said you're just stressed that's all but i later found out that i wasn't all right that whole security detail thing gone past and we were just chilling the barracks and then suddenly my company officer who I was actually very friendly with just busted the door open and said hey nomad and i said sir you want to go see north korea and I said i'm good where i am sir i think we're pretty close to north korea already and he said come on let's go <laughs> and i said what <laughs> pack your shit up like <laughs> and i'm like is it just me and he's like no, with your buddy. So my buddy, meaning <laughs> the buddy who can't speak Korean. <laughs> so so he and I just were on a military bus. And then when we got to a checkpoint, <laughs> the soldier was kind of like off too, because usually like civilians or some tourists might come to the pillbox at the front, like to kind of like to see what's going on. Or sometimes like soldiers who are recruits would go there. But then he just sees like a, like a captain and two soldiers just like, hmm? <laughs> they're like what's your purpose of visit sir and he just goes check in north korea <laughs> and they're like oh okay and just, just fucking let us pass through <laughs> and so when we went there there was a big building with bulletproof explosion proof glasses and right in front of that were pillboxes like endless trenches and from a distance i could see another like a fort with south korean flag and next to it had the united nations flag as well which is kind of surreal and beyond that line what i saw was just forest like they call it the dmz just forest everywhere and then another hilltop with a bunch of other like kind of trench like looking pillboxes there too and i said that must be north korea and the officer just went i want to take a closer look and just gave me like a periscope to look at and when i looked in i saw the north korean flag and like soldiers just like standing guard in their like 90 like 70s 80s uniform that i saw on tvs like just standing still right next to it was like a village and i was like wow that's interesting they have a village that close to the front and the officer said no, that's actually a cover-up. That's actually faking it to be a village. But in fact, only North Korean soldiers go there. They change into their civilian clothing, chop wood and mine resources there so that they don't get bombed or like attacked out of... I don't know why we would do that, but they always assume that we do. But yeah, just in case that happens or something like that. They do that, wear their uniforms back in and they ride right off back to North Korea with all the resources and stuff. And I was like, wow, they must be really scarce of it because why would you come all the way to the front line to, to pick up woods, you know? So yeah, that was some interesting encounters there. And he was like, so what do you think about North Korea? And I'm like, well, I'm already serving here. What are you talking about? Like, I'm already serving against them to fight them off. Like, w what am I, a tourist? And he's like, you got a point, but your buddy here, he must be interested too. And, he, and it was true. Like, he was so mesmerized. He was like, oh shit, like, wow. <laughs> those were kind of fun times i miss it sometimes having those kind of unique unforgettable experiences with someone some people that i never would expect to be with now um it's getting closer to the actual event that where i became a sergeant which is the rank people usually are right before they discharge from the military. I ended up receiving this final training, which is known to be one of the toughest one too. They were giving me a big present on the way back home. When I was there, basically what we had to do was we'll get our blanks and like gear up everything. And we had to basically fight off 
this potential North Korean, like other forces that are pretending to be North Koreans. And we had to have a full scale war against them for our, almost a month. Like we had weeks of sleeping out in the woods. And this was during the coldest of the winter where snows were piling up to like this high up to my kneecaps. Things were tough, but I already had this training before, so I didn't have much trouble physically. But yeah, I mean, the training itself was kind of fun at the same time, really harsh. As in, <laughs> like, people were running out of cigarettes, people were running out of goodies, so MREs became potentially a currency <laughs> where people would go off and say, go to a different artillery battalions or like other different soldiers and say, hey, you guys got any smokes? And they're like, I'll trade you off with five chocolate bars or eight MREs <laughs> and like deal and stuff like that. And because there were no toilets out in the woods, out in the wild was basically a minefield that we all had to like watch our feet. <laughs> I remember one time where I dug up a really, really nice trench and I was like really proud of it too. And we went on an assault so we had to abandon that trenches for a bit and come back to it. And when I came back, these fuckers used it as a public toilet or something. Those guys were who were using it like before us. And I was like, this is what the fuck? Like and my buddy was like, well, you sure made it look like a fucking toilet, you know, like you made it nice and square. And I'm like, Whoosh. Okay, but yeah, those things kind of happen. During one of those nights, our officer actually told us, hey, we're going to do another assault. It's going to be nighttime this time. So make sure you pack everything that's warm, but don't pack it too heavy because weight just means extra sweat and sweat in the cold means the closer you are to death, honestly, because so much high chance you will get hypothermia and so much high chance you're going to fall behind because of all the weight. Like I already knew what was going on. So I just packed some extra socks and just like one MRE or like basic stuff like that, that I could probably get rid of on the way. And we were climbing a mountain during probably like almost way past midnight, like almost closer to sunrise time. And when we were climbing up the mountain, <laughs> we heard like gunshots. So we were like, oh shit, contact. And what we did was we sprinted to the hilltop and probably clear everybody that was like protecting it or somewhere in the vicinity. By then my body was fucking buffed or something. So I already was used to the whole mountain. So I was climbing cliff to cliff and I could see my juniors, the new guys, barely climbing a cliff. And I said, hurry the fuck up because the longer time we waste the thinner the line gets and the less firepower we get to suppress onto the enemy so it's like hurry up and they're like from distance yes sir i'm like yeah on the way i'm like oh my god just <laughs> but eventually we all climbed up took over the hilltop and we're basically there for a good 10 minutes because everybody had to catch their breath. We were all sweating, like no exceptions. Everybody was sweating and the breeze from the hilltop was just like so cold that it just froze off my eyelids and everything like that. Like it, it froze all my eyebrows, froze my nose and everything. So the officer ended up just saying, let's just climb down. I think people will either catch a cold or probably get like hypothermia if you stay up here too long. So we climbed down the mountain and and halfway down there, we ended up taking a quick break. And one of our NCO strictly told us not to fall asleep because one of the biggest ways you can get hypothermia is to fall asleep when you're sweaty and it's cold. So for me to keep myself awake, what I did was there was a tree that I just placed my helmet on my head there. But then I could feel my body slowly slipping away. Like my body was numbing from the tip down to my core. But I was so tired and so sleepy, I couldn't like control that at all and i was like oh shit i think this is what hypothermia is kind of like the only thing i could think of back then was i'm so sleepy i gotta sleep and stuff like that and suddenly from a distance i hear we need help here hello hello hey are you okay we need help here like medic medic this is what i heard and that just woke me up and when i saw what was going on it was a guy from my squad it was a new guy our, our our little brother and my company commander was holding his um shoulders and just trying to like wake him up like hey hey wake up but he was standing still so i approached him and i saw him crying and i said Hey, I know this whole thing sucks. I know it's hard, but we're almost there, okay? We can we, we can get some warm and before I finished my sentence, as he was crying, his eyes were like heightening, like his eyes were rolling up. All I could see was white. So he fell into shock and that just freaked everybody out. And 
the first thing that came up to my mind was I gotta keep him conscious, okay? If we lose him, if he falls into shock and he just passed out, then he's gonna be in real big trouble. You know, I, I asked them questions like, how many fingers am I pointing up? How many siblings do you have? What's your name? What's your name? Tell me, like, uh, answer me at least. And when I asked him about if he has any siblings or not, he said, I'm the only one, like I'm single born. And then as he was saying it, he bursted out crying saying, mom, like why what am i doing here like why am i here i want to go home he was saying stuff like i don't deserve this i you know what am i doing here what did i do wrong in my life basically he 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 didn't know like he he's in the shock and so he was saying whatever that came out of his mouth i guess but yeah um the officers tried to call medevac, which is the helicopter the medical helicopter when we heard the helicopter sound i thought wow okay that was fast. They're gonna get him, right? But it just flew right past us. And so two things went through my mind, thinking, do they just not care about us? Are they not gonna even send a helicopter for this young kid? Or is it because of the woods? Like, is it the trees that are obstructing it from, from sending anything? It's what I thought. As this was happening, he was still shaking. He was still crying. And his body was getting colder. Like, I could feel that he was getting stiff. When we all took our jacket and, like, put a fucking blanket all over him. One guy, I don't know who, but he thought of one brilliant thing. He said, everybody open up your fucking MREs. So MREs, the emergency ration we have, there's a packet where if we pull a strap, it heats up on its own through the chemicals in there. That's how we eat warm food there. As soon as we heard that, 10 of our guys fucking like opened our backpack, opened up our MRE straps, shook it and like shoved it up between his clothes, armpit, like legs and like his feet, uh, even his boots. And to the point where... He started gaining consciences um, back, I think. He just looked straight at me and said, like, he looked straight right into my eye and said, am I going to be all right? And I said, hmm? yeah. I said, you're going home, so you're going to be fine. But yeah, um, eventually the helicopters didn't arrive. So what happened was two of my officers ended up dragging him. One grabbed him and roped down the cliff to the nearest vehicle, shoved them in and sent back to the A station. And as soon as that ended, um, I could see another junior who was supposed to take care of him because he was going to replace me. I saw him and he just gets on his ground and says, you know, five minutes ago, he was talking just normally like with me. And, and I don't know, like he didn't know what to do. And he just started crying, but... <sighs> I think everybody got emotional back then. It still scares me to now that when the whole thing happened, I was stone cold. I was doing what I thought was logical. Like, I had to keep him conscious. So, like, when everybody just cried and everything um, after the whole thing happened, we knew that he was sent to the aid station. I just felt nothing. I was like, <sighs> like, I just said shit. As the whole thing ended, we saw the sunrise going up and... <laughs> Ironically, it was fucking beautiful, you know? It's like all those dark things. It's like a movie where, you know, when all the like climax happens after that, you know, the sun rises from the horizon. It, it just happened. And so after we all climbed down the mountain, I told my NCO that my knee is feeling really off. It really hurts when I press it down. Can I check the aid station as well? And he said, yeah, because during the assault, when we we're climbing up the mountain, we we're climbing up in single file. The guy who was on top of me was a machine gunner. He accidentally dropped his machine gun and it hit me on the knees. And I couldn't even scream because we were ambushing. And I was like, fuck, and just Grabbed that rifle, gave it back to him, and climbed up. But after that, whenever I pressed it down on my knees, it hurt. And I just kind of wanted to check on, on my little brother, our little brother. When we went to the A station, I, I could see him on the bed and all the machines, you know, you see in dramas or something like that, you know, heart monitors, beep, beep, beep. We could see that. And I was like, oh, thank God he's at least all right, you know? <laughs> When we're at the A station, I, I never felt so comforted uh, because they had warm food and they had a heater inside the building and a bed, an actual bed that we could lie down. I kind of wanted to stay there for a longer time, you know?
my knees were a perfect excuse to do that. And the next day, I realized that the new guy, the, the, the little brother, ended up being sent back to our unit because he gained conscious. He's fine now. They told me that, oh, if you guys didn't warm him up with uh, MREs, he probably would have been really severe. But you guys did really well. But they just sent him back. <laughs> I, I noticed that after I came back from shower. That he was gone so normally i should have gone back with him but the food there was so warm like i it was an actual meal in front of me a warm bed and i had gotten selfish i said i have leg injuries i could i could just stay here which i did all that for fucking warm food and a warm bed my selfishness i hate myself even to think back then of what i did i should have been back there with him even if i was back there it wouldn't have improved his health or anything but still i would have been fighting with him that's when i just told my second in command that i i, I can't do squad leader anymore you can do better than me so so i gave him my position as my squad leader i re relinquished it to him and you know, that was my last training. And then COVID happened. And that was when I was out during the weekends and COVID started getting really bad. One day when I was at home resting at my grandmother's place, I just got a call and they said, your service date has been terminated or something. So you're discharged. Congratulations. No ceremony, no goodbyes. Just, just that, just phone call, you know. Later, they sent me a bunch of stuff. And they also sent me like a piece of paper written and it says, from the Ministry of Defense, we thank you for serving for your country despite the need to or something like that. So basically, they just sent me a letter thanking me for volunteering for my service. But yeah, like what does that have to do with anything? After I discharge, I keep dreaming about that night, the whole guilt. You know, sometimes it comes to me at night saying, why did you just leave me like that? Why why didn't you do better? And I could have done better, but you, like you could have done better, but like because of your selfishness, this is what I got, you know? I'm gonna be permanently sick because of you. It's the things that I hear at night. And at one point I said, okay, this is not normal. So I went to see a psychiatrist and you know what he says? He says, I'm normal, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I'm just stressed, that's all. The same thing I heard from that consultant back in the military times. When I came back to the States, I was having that situation where I was just so stressed, I didn't know what to do. Just like back when I was in the ammunition depot. So I went to see a psychiatrist in my school and they ran a bunch of questions and they said, your responses indicate that you have um, PTSD. When I first heard that I kept asking her back, you're saying that I have PTSD, right? Do I have PTSD? Like, are you sure? Not only because I was ashamed that I have this frame of disability on me when everybody else in my platoon, in my company went through the same thing and they just look like they're out fine. And I have this disability because of it. And I didn't even go to actual combat. Like I was, you know, South Korea, you know, one of the divided countries that don't have war going on right now. I was feeling guilty at the same time. I couldn't feel happier knowing that whatever that's going through to me is actually not normal. It's perfectly fine. Everybody has it. It's, it's, it's one of the most comforting words that I've heard, knowing that I'm not alone on this and that people understand what's going through me. You know, if if what what's happening through me is actually normal and people say I'm just overreacting, I probably would have lost my fucking mind. Just how is this normal? How How is going through this normal? But yeah, that whole thing happened, you know? There were so many things that I probably missed out while I was talking about the military. And there are some things I probably have made my mind exaggerate more than how it could have happened. But that's how I saw it in my eyes. And that's how I interpreted the situation. I tried my best to kind of lay it out in the order that I could think of. So yeah, um, thank you for listening. <laughs> you did good. You really did. I'm proud of you. And a lot of other people are too. Tell me a story. I want to hear it. You might think it's boring, but I'm interested.